This week I was just kind of thinking, um, if you've seen the flyer, then you'll know the title of today's sermon. But really thinking about what it is to have the fortune that we have to have overcome the old man. So the title of today's sermon is Surviving the Old Man. And some of us might feel like we're still fighting the old man. When I say the old man, I'm not talking about just some old baba. I'm talking about like the former self, the man in the flesh. And just as we were worshipping, God reminded me of... It's funny, I don't read this very often, but I quote it very often lately. Uh, Matthew 19, I'll just read quickly from verse 16. Now behold, one came and said to him, him being Jesus, God, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And so Christ said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And I want to use it to relate or to think about old physical possessions. I'm going to move a bit further forward. I feel like I'm so far away from you guys. I don't understand. What up? All right. I'm not thinking about it from the perspective of you know, having lots of riches and, and struggling to let go of some of those earthly riches, but I, I was thinking about it in, in terms of Just whatever it is you struggle with, right, that keeps you where you are. I don't know who's struggling with sexual infidelity or sex before marriage and stuff like that, or who's struggling with masturbation, who's struggling with gluttony and loss for the things of the world, who's struggling with earthly possessions, yes, who's struggling with anger, who's struggling with bitterness or resentment. There are things sometimes we're struggling with and the idea of of letting go of them, not even because you don't want to, but because you don't know how to. What is it that Paul said, which we know well, Romans 7. If you can open scripture with me so that you're not reading, you're not just hearing, but also doers of the word, partaking in what the scripture has to offer. I'll read verse 15 and then I'll skip down to verse 19. Pretty much similar things, but. So for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate to do, that I do. (coughs) Then he repeats himself differently in verse 19. He says, for the, the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. It's just this, this battle that we fight so often that I want to deal with today. How do we survive the old man? How do we survive that former version of ourselves, that, that 
thing that we've struggled with for so long because if Paul is saying this in, in Romans 7, then it means that the things he, he thought he'd overcome because he encountered Christ, they didn't just go away. Right? They didn't just go away because he now knew God. He didn't just go away because he now had seen Jesus Christ and said, I want to follow you, I want to serve you, I want to be with you the rest of the days of my life. He still struggled with the things he struggled with before. I feel like we have like a tendency in church and Christianity. In fact, we do. We have, everyone knows Sunday best, right? So you wear your Sunday best to come to church. We have a tendency to, to clothe ourselves and present <coughs> ourselves, our best version of ourselves for people to see and to play perfect we haven't yet let go of all the things that we lost for in the world whether it's riches whether it's whatever it is we haven't yet let go of them we're trying to present ourselves as perfect before men we haven't yet got to the place of actually overcoming the things that we're dealing with of actually getting to the spot where somehow I'm just not I'm not as angry as I used to be. I'm not condemning people because of their actions when I haven't yet looked to my own. I'm not in the secret space in the <coughs> hidden off in my house or in somewhere in my room where no one else can see me doing the things that I judge people of. They actually get over it. And how do we actually do that? How do we survive through the old person, the former person, without it actually killing us? If I look at a couple of examples in the scripture, you have someone like Samson. Samson was born into a weight of responsibility and... <coughs> Do you need water in me? You all right? <laughs> you got water? All right. Um, he was born into a weight of responsibility. They already told him from the moment that he was born, God had predestined him. He'd be strong enough and he'd overcome um, the Philistines and he'd overcome the enemies of his people. And it was a weight and responsibility that he had. But it meant that there were certain things he just couldn't do. Along with that weight and responsibility, sometimes comes pride. Right? You kind of fall into a place of pride when you, you know that this capacity and this strength exists in you. I mean, this guy would go off and he'd encounter a lion and with his bare hands he'd defeat the lion. Even David had to use a slingshot, right? But he overcame a lion with his bare hands. And so when you have that kind of strength, it's very hard for it not to go to your head. It's kind of what happens with, we look at the, with this circumstance with people like politicians and stuff, and you get into positions of power, it's kind of hard for the power not to get to your head. And it affected the way he spoke to his family, spoke to his parents. If you look at the law of God that said, honor your father and your mother, and this guy wants to get married to a Philistine, and he just tells his father, go and get her for me. And his father's like, don't you want to marry someone from our own tribe? Why would you go outside? And he's like, please, I want that one. Bring her. And he goes and he gets what he wants. And he's feeding all the things and the pleasures of this world. And while the spirit of God still comes upon him whenever it's time to fight, that lost and that living in the world eventually is what brings him death, right? He's goes, he falls in love with Delilah and knowing like this this notion, this thing actually it, it fumbles and it messes with my head. This woman says, Tell me the thing that has your power, right? And the moment he tells her something she does it to him and then she brings people to bring him down and then somehow she does this three different times 
and he keeps trying it. Like what then, other than the actual depths of the loss of this world, would frustrate him enough to actually tell him, tell her his secret? To actually tell him about the, the seven locks in his hair that his strength comes from. If it's not being so caught up with gratifying his physical desire or his love for her, that he would risk everything he has. And eventually, that led him to his death, right? And that's the notion I think we've been dealing with for the past few weeks, that when you deal with things on an earthly plane, there's only one place that it's going to end up. And that's your death. Like, dead things can only bring death. And only the thing that has life can give life. And yet we're fighting consistently with this old person. Because no matter how much we know it in our minds, it doesn't look like death to us. It looks like life. It looks like living. Right, satisfying the lost world looks like living. It looks like living to be boiling rich. It looks like living to be able to afford whatever you want. It looks like it looks like living to be able to have however many babes you want. It looks like living to be able to, to go to the club and, and throw whatever money they need to be able to pop whatever bottles you need to pop. It looks like life. It looks like life to get to positions of authority and, and laugh at people that haven't reached that place and be able to condemn and, and command whatever authority it is. Like that's what looks like life when we're looking here. You can tell me a hundred and one times that it is death. But if it feels good, it appears to be life. And so the battle to overcome the, the old man, is, it's hard. And it's not hard because we don't know with our intellect. It's hard because we don't know in our hearts that this thing is actually killing you. It's actually killing you. I'll give an example that I'm dealing with now. And I'm just feeling it because I'm being rebuked in my spirit as I'm speaking right now. Don't use this against me in the future, Alicia. But... Um, <laughs> It's, it's this notion, right? So growing up, always consistently skinny. Like, my metabolism was on my side. I could eat whatever I wanted, do whatever I wanted. It was always on my side. When that twist happened, I can't even tell you, but my metabolism is not fighting for me anymore. It's fighting against me. But I can't immediately of my own self see what is being done to my body while I'm enjoying the junk food that I love. You can tell me, and a doctor can tell me 101 times that that thing is killing me, but I don't see it killing me. I don't see it. You tell people that you wonder why people, you know, somebody had a stroke or had a heart attack. They were 50 and were like, man, these guys were young or their 40s and you can't paint the picture between eating a bar of chocolate <laughs> and a heart attack at 50. Doctors can tell you the science works out, but you can't see the gap and the difference and, and the, the root between what you did and how it killed you. If you look at the story of the Israelites in the wilderness, you can read the Bible and see how their faithlessness meant that they couldn't enter the promised land in terms of God's word. But if you take that little bit of text away, where the Lord said that because of the state of their heart, they will not enter the promise, would you relate their death in the wilderness to their lack of faith? Would you be able to see it? Some of them might have died of old age. 
Some of them might have died in an argument or in a fight with another, one another and someone took the other's life. One of them might have died from heart complications. One of them might have died for thirst or lack of water. And it all seems like different reasons why they all died. But you can't connect it back to the fact that it was just because they weren't living in faith. I mean, these guys, literally, they died in desert. If it was old age and stuff that was killing them or whatever it was, Joshua and Caleb would also have been old. They were also of that generation. So sometimes we don't see what is killing us as a knife or a gun. We don't see it as a weapon of murder. We see it as the fruit of pleasure. Adam and Eve in the garden did not see the tree as killing them. Even if God told them, look, if you eat of this tree, it will lead to death. When the snake came in, why could the snake deceive them? Because they couldn't look at that fruit and actually see death. They weren't looking at some black ugly contaminated thing they weren't looking at something that the appearance of it was poisonous the appearance of it would have been good so you might know something in your mind but it like there's just too much distance to make up in our intellectual minds between how that thing is actually killing us Paul or should I say so I look at him from that perspective is passionate about the kingdom of God. Like he's actually passionate about it. There's nothing that would lead you to kill followers of Jesus if you weren't actually passionate about the kingdom of God. Because the thing that caused him to kill and arrest followers of Jesus was that they were offending his perception of the kingdom of God. The Romans didn't care. The only effect that they had is if it was going to affect them being able to get taxes from the Israelites and the Jews because of the impact they were having on the, the given structure that they had in place. Right? So Paul is passionate about the kingdom of God. He has a perspective of the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God is meant to work. And then there are these people who are following Jesus, who have been followers of Jesus, and he is offended on every level for God. As far as he's he cares, his offense is on behalf of God. And so he's having these guys killed. He's standing by where they're, while they're... While they're um, while they're killing the followers of Jesus Christ, he is watching over, he is having them imprisoned, he is dragging men and women out of their houses you know, by their edges, and he is snatching them and he is throwing them and making sure that they're being imprisoned. He is passionate about the kingdom of God in his eyes. But until he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus, he is unaware of the fact that what he is doing, that he thinks is bringing him life, is actually leading him to death. He is completely unaware that what he is doing is killing him. Because as far as he's concerned, he is doing what is good, what is noble, what is right, what is precious, what is lovely, and what is pure. He is maintaining a standard. And then he has an encounter and he realizes that everything else was killing me. And if just I can get and align myself fully with what has life. And I don't know what is running through your mind about the things that are killing you. I don't know what's running through your mind about the things that are holding you, that you've been struggling with. That you Like, if you, like what I was imagining uh, uh, is like a land full of mines, right? Like landmines and stuff like that, right? And you can tell somebody that they've got to get from this side to that side of the room and tell them that there are landmines everywhere but you don't know specifically where. You might try and tiptoe through the land 
But it's, it's a huge risk because you don't know which step you're going to take is going to be the one that kills you. And that's kind of what it's like living in the old man. We're living in that old version of ourselves, and the version of ourselves that, that God is trying to call us out of every single day is a risk of eternal death. <laughs> like of ending in this place where you've been living and you've been enjoying your pleasures. You go, you hang out with your friends, you do whatever it is you do. You, 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 you meet someone today, you sleep with them tonight, you do whatever it is and every single day it feels like it's okay because it hasn't killed you yet. But you don't know which one is going to kill you. You don't, you don't know when you're going to step out in the middle of the road and a car is going to sideswipe you and you, you're still living in the old man. And so surviving the old man is such a precious gift from God. Like the opportunity to encounter him before we could eat of the tree of eternal life. The question of why did God kick I'm just going to put this down so I can focus. Why did God kick Adam and Eve out of the garden after they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? This notion exists with Pharaoh, right? Let's consider Pharaoh as having eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Let's consider him that way because once Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we have all for that same way partaken of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. And so Pharaoh knows good and evil and he makes a choice. This is what we were talking about last week about Romans 1.28. He may has a choice before him and the, he chooses consistently to, to instead of upholding what is noble in the eyes of God, he says he considers it foolish to look at the standard of Christ and the standard of heaven and the standard and the thinking of God and he decides to think in his own knowledge and so he hardens his heart. Now God then says, I'm going to keep your heart in this perpetually hardened state because you have shown that you are not ready to think according to the level of my thinking, right? And he hardens his heart and now Pharaoh is stuck in this place where no matter what the no matter what Moses does when God shows himself in a different way he'll he'll for a moment see the idea of what God's power can do but he'll still be like no I'm going to live according to how I live. And so his heart has been hardened and he's stuck where he is. There's at this point the decision has been made over Pharaoh's life and Pharaoh does not see God. Now we are in a similar position. Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden because they've eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they are consistently now in a place of death. And if they stay in the garden and then they eat of the tree of life, what they do is they seal in the eternal where their heart is today. And so sealed in the eternal is them living in the place of death. And so God kicks them out of the garden so that they would not put into eternity their death. They would not seal themselves to the place of death. And God gives us that same choice every day. We've taken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right now, we see death. But God wants to present us with the opportunity to no longer be death. It's why he sent Jesus Christ. He offers us life. And now the thing that we get to eat of and stay eternally in is life. But we have to fight through the old man. We have to fight to the place of surviving the old person, surviving the mistakes, surviving the error, surviving the sin, surviving the attraction, the gluttony, the, the lust, the, the, the passion for the things that do not bring life. And we do not know it's like the story they say of the, the guy who goes to church and the pastor does an auto call and he says, I'll give my life next week. I'll do it. I'll do it next week. And the pastor's like, look, do it now. 
because we do not know what the future holds. And this guy goes home and is tormented in his sleep. And he keeps on thinking about it, but he keeps on letting it go. Keeps on thinking, I'll give my life later. I'll give my life later. I'll give my life later. And one day he goes to sleep and he doesn't wake up the next day. There's a choice in front of us. The Bible says that if anyone is in him, he is a new creation. If anyone is in him, he is a new creation. And he says that if you are in him, you are a spirit. You are no longer flesh. You are no longer the carnal being. You have suddenly become fresh, new. A spirit being. And that offer stands before you. But we're tormented. And, I, and, I, I, and I'm laying this choice here and it's, it seems weird to come before a, a room full of Christians who have given their life before and have come to church every Sunday and, and are praying to God. But I know that there's something that Pastor Wally said earlier in the, in the GLA service. He was talking about, we tend to do this thing where, was it him or was I listening to a sermon this morning? I can't remember, but it was one of the two. But I heard it today, that's what matters. Um, <laughs> we tend to do this thing where we say, you know, yeah, it was him, right? The carnal Christian, which you learn in mass life, and we talk about the spiritual Christian, and we, we lay different kinds of forms of Christianity or somebody that's in the world. But the truth is, there's only, there's only one. You're either with Christ or you're against him. There's, you're either in him or you're outside of him. It says that if, if you say that there's no sin in you, then you're a liar. And if you're a liar, then Christ can't be in you. There's... There's, there's no two roads. If say you've never sinned, then you're a liar. If you say that, you know, you still fulfill all these things, it's very powerful what Paul says when he says that if I do these things and I don't desire to do them, then it, it's not me doing them. It, it's the flesh. I know that we're still battling with things. I don't know what it is you're battling with personally, but you might know what you're struggling with right now that you've been trying so hard to give it to God. Like, God, I just, I need you to take it away from me. Like, I don't know how to deal. I keep feeling like I'm, I'm subject to this person. I'm subject to this, to this old man. I'm subject to this former version of myself. I'm, I'm subject to, to, to consistently just lost after these things it's like we always use this thing as a joke about Leonardo DiCaprio and the fact that this guy keeps on getting older but the people he dates keep on being the same age and and, and it's it is this notion of this idea that we're meant to grow past something but we keep on being attracted to what we used to have we keep on being attracted to what we're meant to have grown past we keep on being attracted to the things that that don't satisfy why did Jesus go to the woman at the well? He said, where's your husband? She said, I don't have a husband. He said, you speak honestly, but you've had, is it five husbands? And the one that you're with now is not your husband. And he, he sees that no matter how much she's fought to get out of this pattern, she's felt like she's been trapped in who she used to be. She's been trapped in how people see her. She's been trapped in how she sees herself. She's been trapped in the way that she thinks is the only way out of her circumstance or situation. She feels trapped in who she's been. And I don't know where you are, what it is that feels like it's trapping you, feel like it's holding you down. Feels like no matter how many times you confess that you're not that person, you keep making that same mistake. And you keep on fighting this battle with the old version of yourself. You keep on fighting this version with the old man. And you want to get out of it. You want to you wanna fight your way out of who you've been to who you are and it feels weird saying this is who you are because it doesn't feel like who you are because you, you feel like you're still who you were because you feel like you're still fighting the same battles 
and you're still losing the same battles. You, you, you keep dating the same people. You, you, you're thinking that, God, I want you to, to present me with the person that I'm going to be with for life. But then every single time you keep finding yourself attracted to people with the same characteristics that let you down and hurt you. And you feel like you're meant to be a new person, but you keep being attracted to the old things. And you want to overcome it. That scripture where Jesus says that set your eyes on the things above. Yes, you, you died with Christ, but you also risen with him. And, and set your heads on the things above because that's where your life is. Where it's hidden. And so you keep trying to come into this version of yourself but you keep being attracted to the dead things and God said there's only one place where my life is where your life is it's in me I don't know what you're struggling with but if you want to lay it at his feet today and come before him and say God I want to put the old man behind me and walk in the truth of who you say I am who you've called me to be where you've called me to be to the standard of living that you've called me to to uphold the kind of righteousness that you've called me to to go back to what your original plan was, is it's something very powerful that happens in the book of Genesis. God plants the garden. And it says that dew comes from the ground. That waters the plants that they might grow. And we know that up until Noah has built the ark, it never rained. And if the original plan of God was really everything that's in the garden up until the fall of man, it was never meant to rain. It means that God always planted on the inside of us whatever it would take for us to, to grow. We don't have to wait for an external source between, and in the garden, the water that would plant, that would water the plants came from within the ground. God wants to take us back to the original picture where the person he has called you to be will come from within. That's why he said, Behold, I knock on the doors of your heart. If anyone would let me in, I would dine with him and him with me. He said, I want to be within you. I've offered, I died on a cross that my spirit would be within you. That you're no longer looking to external sources to satisfy what is going to come from within no longer gratifying the things of the flesh because your wholeness comes from within. Your healing comes from within. Your strength comes from within. Your grace comes from within. God, right now I lay before you, my old man, who I've been. And I pray we can walk in who you've called for us to be that we can put the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes. What's the third one? Pride of life. Pride of life. These things that make up the former man behind us. And we can walk in who we are truly are meant to be. God, you have given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. That means everything that is required to survive the old man, put the old man to death and walk as a new creation is in us. And so we come before you saying we want to enter into you, into your presence, that you might be in us and us in you. We might overcome everything the world has told us that we are, that we are not. Everything the enemy has told us that we are, that we are not. Everything our minds has told us is supposed to be, that is not. That we can truly put away 
the patterns of this world and set a standard for our life that is the pattern of the kingdom of God that we can walk in it truthfully, honestly, boldly, courageously that every time you call us to something we can actually be that and not look and say but I'm not good enough lies, lies of the old man lies of the old man lies of the old man get thee behind me Satan we put away every lie every carnality every aspect of our flesh we put it away now it is in you O Lord for us to overcome the old man God I pray for every single person here struggling struggling with the loss of the eyes they get caught up in what they see caught up in in, in just attaining the things in front of them they get so lost in in what the world presents they get so caught up in what in what we see on Instagram and what Instagram tells you is success in what social media or the world or media tells us is good that is not good we put away every single thing that that rises up from our appetite that lusts after the things of the flesh everything that that makes us desire worldly satisfaction in a moment that makes us put put to, to put away and put behind us what you've promised us just to satisfy us and I know that you know this feeling of of being in the middle of sin and realizing this thing isn't even satisfying me it's not even helping me and and the moment that I'm done with it I, I I feel that same emptiness God help us to get past that that thing that makes us feel we have to feed ourselves for a moment only to still feel empty and somehow even though we know by experience it does not satisfy we run back in that same place to feed us again God help us put that away and there's only one way that's why you said it you said the people who drink of this water they will thirst again but he whoever drinks of the water I have that would be on him, on the inside of him like a, a spring of living water bursting into eternal life that there's only one thing that has the capacity to satisfy and I don't know what you've been doing where you've been going for your satisfaction that you keep lusting over in your mind and in your heart and in your actions and it hasn't done enough and God says right now I present to you a better option I present to you me my spirit and I know we all say that once we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross we receive the spirit but where is our heart's belief right now where are we struggling to believe that we actually have that spirit Jesus said before that he said when he encountered the disciples after he'd risen again he said the Bible says he breathed on them and he said receive the Holy Spirit receive my spirit God we've tried everything else breathe upon us now that finality of the eternal spirit of God that puts to death the flesh God we cry out now for testimonies people here who will go forth and never masturbate again who will be able to set their eyes on the kingdom of God and have the endurance and the stamina and the patience and the, the self control and, and, and the the faithfulness to your kingdom To focus only on you and you alone until their spouse comes. God, 
help your children right now to put away those things that have weighed them down for far too long God we come and we just thank you with faith in our hearts with our minds set on you that we have overcome the old man that you have helped us survive the old man and step in and become new creation God we declare in this room we are a new creation we are who you say we are in the mighty name of Jesus Christ Amen Amen Amen